all these physical benefits come back to the psychological world. So you come in and we know flow state's important. So let's program something that's going to get them into flow state in some regard, uh, an enjoyment base, something that makes them smile, something that makes them laugh. So that's the first part that I have to my thing. All right, flow state. How can we get them in that flow state? How can we get them to laugh? How can we get them to smile? Then how can we funnel that energy that we just created in the sense, in quotations, created that flow state, you created that energy, you got a bunch of smiling, happy athletes. What do you do with that energy? So then we talk about the funnel process. So now we funnel it into something that we want to work on that day. Maybe it's something skill retention. Maybe, maybe we want to learn a skill with an athlete. Maybe it's output based. Maybe we want to run our flying tens right after that. So we'll funnel it into an output based thing that we want to work on that day. But that's all kind of external. It's very social. After that happens, that energy is really, really high. How can you bring them back in? How can you draw them internally to an internal focus? And that's where we really like to use our ISOs and like our 100 to 1,000 rep schemes. You draw them back into themselves. Mm. That was Austin Joshua, and you're listening to the Just Fly Performance Podcast. Today's show is brought to you by Lost Empire Herbs. You can get 15% off my favorite herbs for well-being and athletic performance by heading to lostempireherbs.com slash justfly. About three years ago, I got into herbalism after having Logan Christopher on the podcast, starting with the Phoenix formula, which literally had my body buzzing after I took it. Not in a jittery way, like coffee, but in a way where I really felt the herbs working with my body. Within two weeks, I was already noticeably stronger in the weight room. And ever since, I've made herbalism a regular part of my training regimen. I've totally ditched any sort of caffeine-laden pre-workout, and I really enjoy using supplements that come directly from the earth. Lost Empire Herbs was started by Logan Christopher and his two brothers to help bring back the lost empire of nature in our connection to it, and to bring the power of herbs to the general public. Again, if you want to see my favorite herbs, such as Shilajit, which has been mentioned by other podcast guests on this show, Phoenix Formula, and more, as well as get 15% off your purchase alongside a 365-day money-back guarantee, head to lostempireherbs.com slash justfly. Welcome back to another episode, and thanks for being here. So one common theme that's been long-running in this podcast has been finding ways to help training in the gym transfer to sport more. And this can be on the mechanical level and special strength work, but it's also really important in looking at the mental and emotional level of things and the perception and reaction level. At some point, we can do so much hair splitting with the minutia of sets and reps or different variations of weight room exercises, which certainly do have value. But at the end of the day, we don't want hair splitting minutia to take away from time that we can spend learning and developing other important components of athletics. In developing those important components, that's one of the reasons that I absolutely love talking to our guest today, Austin Joshum. Austin is the owner of Joshum Strength, where he works with athletes and quote-unquote washed-up movers to become the best versions of themselves. Austin is the host of the Joshum Strength podcast and was a former NCAA D3 All-American football player, as well as a hammer thrower. Austin is passionate about blending sport elements into the traditional gym setting for athletes, Austin himself is a meathead, but also a diehard athletic mover and passionately trains in a way that definitely encompasses both those archetypes of strength, as well as performing ideally in one's sport and movement practice on a physical and emotional level. For the show today, Austin will speak on the art of developing a love for movement and play in athletes, how to build a scores mentality, as well as how to optimize game-based scenarios to help improve one's transfer to the field and to help work on one's weaknesses. He also speaks on intentionally driving athletes into their weaknesses and then going back to their strengths in a gym setting. Austin will finish on how he sets up his own training programs, not only from a physical component or physical level, but also on the mental and emotional elements of each thing that's happening in the gym as he goes through a training session. This is one of those shows that's an expand your brain show. It helps us to see training in a new layer and with new perspectives on things and really helps appreciate just that total transference that there's that meathead level, but then there's that athletic mover and that resilient, uh, mentally, emotionally resilient athlete level of things. And this is a show that really blends everything together really well. I think you guys will really enjoy this episode. I always love talking to Austin, so let's get on to it. 
Austin, you had a story about two different soccer coaches who had some very different or opposing methods that uh, you encountered recently. Could you share a little bit about those coaches and their approaches to training and some of the results that came about? Yeah, and and this is pretty funny because I was watching this and I, I was literally like, I wish Joel could be here to watch this and like see how this is going down. So we just moved into our new facility. And at this new facility, we have like 75 yards of turf that we share with a soccer team. So whenever the soccer teams aren't on it, we get to go on the turf and use it and have it. Um, so half uh, during these Wednesdays, half of the court is used by this youth soccer coach. Uh, it's about fifth and sixth graders. They come in and this coach, he wears the national championship, uh, like soccer thing. You can tell like he, he you, like was a big deal. It's probably a really, really good coach. Um, and he goes there, sets up all those ladders, sets up all these cones, and it's very structured. He gets there probably 25 minutes before every session, before the, even the first kid shows up to start warming up. Everything is beautifully set up. And all of these kids come in, they funnel in, and they're running through all these drills. They're running through these ladder drills, these cone drills. And on the other side of the court is my group of athletes, and it's the collegiate group of the athletes, and we're playing this ultimate Frisbee game. And we made this Frisbee game up where, like, you have to throw it off this soccer pipe to score points. So there's some movement. There's some tracking and tackling. Anyways, it's, it's this goofball game, like nothing you'll ever use on the field, but just more for fun, and you're, you're, you're warming up in that sense. And the group that is not on the field, so he has a group that's on the field at all times and a group that's off the field at all times. And the group that's off the field is not watching the group that's on the field. They are watching our group and they're cheering us on. And this fourth and sixth grade is like watching this goofball game, cheering on, super exciting for them. And their coach just starts to get like angry, not at us, but at the kids. He's like, hey, this isn't recess. Focus up. You guys want to be great. You got to focus. You got to do this. Got to pay attention. And one, the whole rant of like, it's not recess. Uh, it probably should be more like recess. They're in fourth to sixth grade and there, there's a lot of, physical development that needs to happen in the first place before we start to focus on these ladder and drills. But I just wanted to focus on the attendance. So first week he had three teams there. Second week, only two teams showed up. And the first, last week there was only five people that showed up to this kind of session. And he, again, he's laying everything out perfectly in, in the collegiate sector. It's everything we would dream of like mm -hmm. the perfect setting. You're setting up all these beautiful drills. You're setting up everything and coaching them hard, doing all these things, but it's so militaristic it's so strict there's no freedom i never once saw a kid anytime the kids like just take the ball and kick it and have fun he tells them to get back in line he tells, and it's not like a mean way it's just get back in line focus up do this and i watch that and i'm like oh my goodness like this is everything that i try to like go away from and the very next day another youth soccer coach comes in and he shows up one minute before all the kids get there so like in the collegiate setting, again, a coach would look at, oh, he didn't get there 15 minutes early. That's bullshit. Like he's not setting everything up. <laughs> he set up cones and ladders again, which I'm not a fan of huge cones and ladders, but he just set them up. He just put them out there, threw a couple balls in the middle and then brought 20 kids into a circle and said, hey, we got all this stuff set up. Like, go have fun. Go play. Like, go do this. And the kids just had a blast. They were just kicking the ball at each other. They were doing some goalie stuff. They're running over these ladders. They were diving over the ladders, like the best use of ladders I've ever seen because the kids got to come up with the exercises that the ladders instilled. And they're running through all these drills, doing all this stuff for fun. And they're all laughing. The excitement is super high. The coach probably said four words the entire time and then left the session. And again, the collegiate guy would look at that session and be like, that's bull crap. They're wasting their money. The kids are going there and they're not getting coached super hard. They're not being directed. And then every week, he has had more kids show up to his camp. He has had more kids be super active. There's way more running that I see in their session. There's way more, if you want to say, skill work done in his session because they're handling the ball. They're kicking to each other. They're doing some fun goalie stuff. They're playing some fun games. And I just thought it was really cool to see the two different sides and one which would be rewarded in the collegiate sector, but it's obviously not working, yet we like close our eyes to it because as coaches, we want to feel important. As coaches, we want to feel like, we need to set up this drill. We need to set up this. We need to have everything perfect. And it's not that it's a bad coach or a bad person. It's the bad thought process behind it. It's like, let athletes, athletes, let athletes be kids, you know, and you're going to get so much more out of that, not only physically, but also like you're having them show up every week, you know, like we want to talk about long-term improvement. Like what's the number one point of long-term improvement? It's 
being able to practice, show up and continually do something over and over and over again. And in one session where he's having them free reign, they are doing that. They're showing up every week and they're getting a ton of work in and they're having a blast in the other session. The kids don't want to come anymore. Yeah, I, I love that. I, I have a few thoughts. One was I was thinking about um, like here's two different ends of the spectrum. On one end, it was um, Joel Reinhardt when he was on the show, uh, someone who's working in the collegiate sector, talking about reducing the noise in a training setting, meaning if the athletes can get their work done through through just playing, through gameplay and short set of games and all the variations, then why do you need all the extra running or conditioning like that, that idea, uh, which I really like that. And then I also think on the total other end of the spectrum, I think of my three-year-old son who my daughter is five and I, I think she might be like a more of an individual sport person. She's a really like hard worker, just almost for the sake of it type person. Whereas my son, like he's, he'll say too hard a lot, but if you throw a ball out, like he is so energized. And if you kick a ball with him, he's like be huffing and puffing and so tired, but he doesn't notice it because he's, he's playing and he's engaged and he's having fun. And he's honestly, um, for whatever we quantify being a good athlete, like reactive, fast on the ball, perceives like he's the athlete. <laughs> and so it's kind of funny that the person who wouldn't quote unquote work as hard in rudimentary drills is so much more energized when there is a ball going around and something to to chase after and whatnot. And so I just I just think this is so important how much yeah, we 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 tend to think of ourselves as so important and we are gonna get these athletes in such good shape. We are gonna teach them. No, the athletes are gonna they're they're wired to have fun and to and it all comes in one package too. They get in shape. And they do the thing, like they, they get, they hit the systems by having fun and doing those things. And I imagine if you, if you were crazy and you decided to put GPSs on all those fourth to sixth graders, <laughs> you would probably see a tremendous amount of speed and acceleration and change of direction in that second coach's workloads. Exactly. And that, that's something like I want to, I, I love tying it together because it's like a, an alpha male strength coach will hear, hear this and like, it's all bullshit. Like he's like, I want greatness. So I want to win. And to me, it's like, how do you get greatness? How do, how do you, if you talk to the greats, you listen to the greats talk, you listen to really, really, really good athletes talk. I think about my own past successes, anything that I've ever been good at, it's because you become obsessed with it. Like you are obsessed with it. And obsession drives the insane amount of reps that you're willing to do, the insane amount of drills that you're able to do. And how do you become obsessed with something? You got to fall in love with it. And so to me, it's like as a strength coach, as a performance coach, as a movement coach, or like whatever you do, your goal is to get them to fall in love with movement, with their movements. And when you get them to fall in love with it, the obsession takes place and the athlete does it. But there's so much of trying to break that obsession and force them to do things. And it's like, that's not how greatness is created. You never, you never make a mule something great. You never force them to become great. It's somebody, some way fell in love with something became stupidly obsessed with that process and then you can't stop that you can't stop that You're that that athlete is going to do so much more than you could ever program than you could ever think about because it's not work to them anymore and that's how we need to to in my world frame it because it's it's not in a sense just fun and games you're not just, i love making the joke like all we do is play you know again if you put the gps on them the amount of work that is being done is going to be through the roof the amount of work that that obsessed athlete is going to do compared to the non-obsessed athlete is going to be, it's not even going to compare. And that work is what leads to the greatness. So it's when it is fun and when it is play that that's part of it, but it also leads to the results. And that's where it's like, all right, it is just play, but the play is what leads to that obsession and mm -hmm. leads to falling in love with what you're doing. Yeah. I think about, I have a couple of thoughts. One was kid boy Johnson and he was on the show talks about in the context of the hammer throw, which I know you've thrown the hammer, I think a little bit. Uh, so you probably, at least uh, from, from your workings with it, probably can understand this quite well. But the idea that as soon as the athlete starts that throw and the ball is set in motion, everything that is like every cue that's inserted into that system is going to detract like from the potential of the throw. And it strikes me that it's almost like you have the potential for obsession early, but it's almost like the more coaching up, like the more coached up you make things, the more drill oriented you make things, you could almost, um, you could almost reduce that. And that's not to, 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 to um, diminish the value of coaching, even in just working with young, like five-year-old soccer players. I've seen athletes who not through anything I've done other than just simply encourage them or tell them they can do this. 
But most of the strides those athletes make at that young age are just, it's just confidence, like knowing they could, or like they scored a goal and then everything kind of changed or for them because they finally did it and, and seeing like confidence grow and, and that, but maybe that's a little bit different than play. But I know for me personally, I've probably told this story on this podcast before when I was, I used to love baseball, I was obsessed with baseball until I was probably about 11 years old. I mean, I used to watch it and I used to go out and pitch and try to emulate the pitchers with the high like leg kicks and all this stuff. And I was having fun with it. And I was obsessed, like totally obsessed. And I remember having coaches who were like, no, you're not supposed to do it like that. And they, they actually, I think, were telling me the totally wrong thing. They told me to actually completely stop my momentum and totally stop and then throw. And I was like, that's not how you do it. And they were arguing with me about this. And anyways, it just completely destroyed my love for that. Like my obsession was pretty much gone after that because it was like they broke my, my love for that exploration. And anyways, uh, not, to, not to take that off into a little bit of a trail, but I, I do think that there's so much um, like they, how, would, how do you think you cultivate that? I guess is what I'm trying to ask you. Like how, um, how do we cultivate that obsessiveness that can lead to greatness in athletes without overdoing uh, the coaching end of it? make an environment in which they can be themselves, make an environment in which the art of it is embraced and enjoyed. And I think that's something like my goal at the gym right now is to make them fall in love with movement in general. Like what can you do with your body? How can you fall in love with what your body can do artistically output wise, like whatever it is, like we want you to fall in love with movement, fall in love and become a learner and lover of movement. Once you have that, once you get to the point of addiction of, Oh, my body can do that. What can I do? Oh, my body can do this. How can I take that to the next level? That, and you can see it in the athletes. You can see it in their eyes of, we had, we had this one athlete that we were doing some gymnastics stuff and he wanted to, he wanted to try a front flip and he just sent a front flip, stuck it. And as soon as that happened, the light in his eyes is like, Oh, what can I do now? Once you get that mindset of what can I do now? Now you can funnel it into whatever you want. Maybe it is your job. Maybe if you want to take it completely out of sports, it's your job. It's whatever you want. What can I do with this? How can I do that? But maybe it is your sport. What can I do on the practice field? All right. I'm, I know my body's capable of amazing things. I know I physically can do this. I know I mentally can push that barrier. How can I do this on the field now? I know, I know I'm capable. Uh, coach wants me to do this. All right. I can do it now. And that's something that once you get that trigger, it's like almost lighting that fire in them and making that that obsessive obsessive piece of pushing the boundaries i think i think it's super powerful and i don't think we talk about that enough yeah it makes me think it's almost um like kind of zooming out a little bit it it's almost like a ritual thing in the sense of there's all these opportunities in the world of sport no matter where you are to um kind of break through the threshold or like a, there's this like liminal space it's like the edge of your abilities and um, like Tommy John talks about like leveling up, like uh, there's opportunities to level up. I think there's, and there's a lot of them. I mean, I've seen athletes level up. It meant like holistically, like mentally just by doing uh, push-ups and wanting to quit. And then me just encouraging them and telling them they could do more. And I've, I've seen that be something, uh, but there, it's not just that. I think that's the way that the grind would you know, that's the grind side of it that I think most people would probably say, well, that's the only way to do it. <laughs> I've seen it also happen in um, like, yeah, just watching youth soccer, watching a, a young athlete score a goal for the first time. And then all of a sudden they're just beaming with confidence and everything changes or um, going to Rafe Kelly's return to the source and seeing um, like a human movement retreat and watching how everything changed for people. The big one was like jumps, like doing like rock jumps into bodies of water and people just gradually going higher and higher and higher and seeing them them change. And and I noticed that in myself too when I got back, like more willing to take on risk. And it, I think of it as you have all these opportunities to level up, not just not just in a skill, but but just as a human being. And there's so many ways you can do that in the gym. So your the the flip um example made me think of that. And I I think maybe before this year I or, you know, a year or two before this, I would have only thought of it in terms of you know, maybe if you do an extreme ISO lunch for five minutes, then you level up, right? Like, <laughs> and that, that you can definitely do that too. Um, but yeah, just that there's so many ways to do that in the movement space. Yeah. And I think part of, and I, I loved your coach, uh, your talk with coach Wayful on this because it's, we've been doing something like this too, is like part of your, your job in the private sector or in the, the collegiate sector is kind of bridge the gap. All right. So this is, this just triggered my thought. It's, 
you, you get them to level up within their own bodies and their own thought process and you get that confidence. And now how can you bridge that to a game-based environment? There is so, and I don't think we talk about this no, enough. There are so many kids that haven't won in their life. They, mm-hmm. they, they haven't won because the winners, like the best athletes, they always win. They always produce. Mm-hmm. They always do it. Playground at the start of the playground to where we are. And we always value that. And we always reward that. And we always reward that one kid. So you have, if it, let's say it's two kids on the football field. You got nine kids on the football field that are always support players. All right. How can you get those kids? How can you create winners out of those kids? How can you yes. get them in their head to create winners? And one of the, I, we've been doing it naturally, but I love the way coach Waple put it. He's like, give them superpowers, you know, like do that mm-hmm. thing where, all right, I want, the, I know this, this kid can score. I know he's been this freaking, he's been the stud all of his life. I love that. We're going to embrace that. But how can we want to get him to share the ball? Because if, if you just make it goal-based, if you just give them a game, the athletes are going to like, they're going to want to win. And they're going to do that by giving it to the best person on the field, e- even in the silly games, like they want to win. So they're going to give it to the same kid over mm-hmm. and over again. And then you're going to keep grooving those patterns of that kid's a winner. I assisted him, which mm-hmm. isn't the end of the world, but how can you give that one kid, the assistant kid kind of that power? So something we've been doing is like, all right, if this kid scores, he's worth two points. All right. Mm. So now the guy that wants to win, the guy that is the stud, he always scores by himself. He knows he's only worth one point himself. He's going to try and feed the ball to somebody else, you know, like he's going to expand the fields and try and creative ways to, all right, now we've built the confidence within themselves and they know them. Okay. I can do that flip. I can do that role. I can hold that ISO. I'm more confident in myself, but now it gets to a team in an environment and I've never really won. I've never really scored. I've never really done that. How can I do that now? Okay. Now I'm worth two points. Oh, I'm scoring left and right now. I can do this. And that's where you start to see. It's like, okay, it's not as much physical as you think. Because now this kid has confidence and now he's balling out like he's doing Mm -hmm. crazy things and he's making the stud that was the only one to score before he's making a miss. He's doing these things because he has that confidence because all you did is get him over that hill of I am a scorer. I am a winner. And you start to bridge those gaps in the in the performance setting. And I just I just don't know if we think about these things. You know, I don't think we're trying to push the barrier and the border on these things. We're we're thinking about in sets and reps and volumes, which Mm -hmm. is great. But we totally lose the psychological side of what these athletes face, where they're coming from and how much that affects the athlete and the performance. I wanted to take a quick break from the show to tell you a little bit about our sponsor, simplyfaster.com. Simplyfaster.com is a fantastic coaching resource, not only on the level of their blog and all the information they put out, but also on the level of their online store. With the click of a button, you can see and purchase the technology that is utilized by so many of the world's great coaches. In SimplyFaster.com's online store, you can have access to training technology such as blood flow restriction training, timing systems, including the free lap timing system, bar speed tracking devices, a variety of resistance training machines, such as the K-Box, and also Kaiser training units, which Kaiser training units being strongly recommended by sprint coach Randy Huntington, for example. You'll also get access to motorized sprint training units such as the 1080 Sprint, force plates, and much more. You can check that all out by heading to simplyfaster.com. That's simply with an I, faster.com. Let's get back to the show. I love that. Um, yeah, because it makes me think about, uh, it's just interesting, like people who, um, like my, my own brother was like this. He was a little more, like a little more, just a little more timid in the sense of like trying to score. And in soccer, he would play defense. And then his daughter plays now plays defense, you know, and not, not that there's anything wrong with that, certainly. But like you should, he, he's even told me in a recent conversation, he's like, oh, if I could go back, I would have liked to play offense. You know, I mean, just because I think for the reasons that you just said, there's something with that confidence of knowing you can, like maybe, maybe in the game, you're best at the defense, but to be able to, in a different game, have that scores mentality, yes, I can do this, I think is really important. And I, it, my, actually, my wife showed me, it was in the, this local paper that was just delivered to our, I don't know if they threw it out in front of our driveway or what, but it was, um, it was a, a local water polo player. And it was a boy who, and we've seen these types of situations before, uh, where like they'll, sometimes like they'll let a kid score who has like a, a disability, and that's always awesome. Um, and but this kid, uh, yeah, he had a disability from birth. Like his joints were fixed. Like water polo was the only sport he could play because he spent a lot of time in the shallow end. But they, um, there was a power play, and the other team wasn't like just folding over. Like they were still playing defense. 
but they were trying to get this kid the ball uh, to set him up to score. And then he got an assist, which was cool. Like he was, ha- he he got an assist. And then finally, after however many tries, like this kid who, like, if you see a picture of him, like his lower body not very developed, feet are pointed sideways. Like the kid finally scored, got it past the goalie who was trying, you know, and everyone just went nuts. Like the whole, the whole place went nuts. People's hair stood on end. Like, like that is what is about. I mean, how how amazing, you know? Like, I'm. I mean, I was just. I'm sure. Like everyone felt the electricity of that moment. And like, just for what you're saying, like that that kid scored, like that's worth a thousand points. You know what I'm saying? And just a shade of, I mean, anyways, that idea and just of reading that story in the paper, I'm like, that is so awesome. I'm definitely going to, next time I play a game with a group, we're definitely like that kid who's kind of timid, who's kind of like, you know, if you score, it's worth this. Like how cool of an idea. I, I absolutely love that. Yeah. And the, like, again, I try to, I try to tie it back into the real world. I feel like I'm me and myself, I'm very woo woo woo. So I'm very into the psychological world. I'm very thinking about it in the spiritual sense and that type of world. But even if you just want to tie it into the physical world, it's like, watch the way that athletes walk differently. Like you're telling me those two aren't connected. We, 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 we've had at, like, the, the coolest story, the coolest story of all of them. We had an athlete with like a, a twitch and I'm not sure what the twitch was from, but when he first met us, it was all the time. Like he, he would shake your hand and he had a right hand head shift or a twitch and he would, it, his ear would go closer to his shoulder and he would twitch. And the more and more and more confident he got, it completely disappeared. And I was thinking in my world, okay, that's just because he's more comfortable with us. Maybe it was a nervous twitch. Uh, and when you walk into a new environment, you walk into the new gym, and a bunch of new people you're meeting, you're going to be nervous. It's going to be coming out. And we, we never talked about the twitch. We never said anything. But he came up to us and he said uh, his parents were told by his teacher that the twitch is completely gone, you know, like hmm. in those senses. It, it, so it's expanding. The physical part is expanding past the gym and psychologically because he's more confident. He's walking. That was the first part. You notice it with a bunch of timid athletes is watch when you're athlete. The first time you meet your athlete, watch how they walk into the gym because you'll know right away, like almost 100 percent what they're thinking, what they're thinking in that moment, who they are, how they interact with the world. And if their eyes are down, if their shoulders are down, if they're walking and louching, not in a depressed sense, but just kind of shriveled up and down and they're walking down, watch that and note that. And then watch a month or two down the road. If you've created a winner, if you created something that becomes confident, it's completely different. They're, They're walking completely upright. Their head is back They're standing taller. And you're just building these things without focusing on these things it's not telling them to fix their posture it's not telling them to be confident it's creating confidence it's creating and building it holistically rather than like just just do it like just be motivated just do it's like that we we have so much power in our session that i don't think we're expanding on enough yeah the the whole topic um it takes me to something you had posted i don't know maybe a year ago or more it was like it was like a drill it was like called everyone scores or something like that where it's like a game just kind of a game right like tell me take me into a little bit of um like yeah there's the giving um giving uh having a particular player being worth more uh points and like the super power thing which is just so awesome i actually i for ne- the next soccer season i coach i and especially as the kids get older i can't wait to start infusing some of these ideas i just think it's so brilliant but like um, like tell me about developing a scores mentality, uh, outside of that, like just in the way you might set up games or, uh, different drills or fun things for the athletes to do. And do we want, do we want the scores mentality in the sense of like football specific, or do you want like the holistic, like, do we want to know how to score? Or do you want holistically how to create that scores mentality? Um, either let's go, maybe start with, um, start with football specific and then briefly, and then just transition into general. Yeah, because football specific is I to me, and I, it's any sport specific. If you want to get into the specifics, how you do it is let them score from all angles in all different situations, and creating that. That is something that uh, time and time again, the athlete comes back. It's like I, I use that. I, I felt that. You, you you watch them play. You watch what they're good at. You watch what they're bad at, and then you create the environment. You create the game base of putting them in that situation, and it's not all right, you see this exact play here, he's struggling and you just create the perfect drill. It's very conjugate style of you're going to expose them to all different game situations so they can grab pieces and information from it and expose it to all. So let's say you have a really fast athlete 
that is struggling with some change of direction stuff, you make you make the space wider and shorter, you know, like it's simple stuff like that to where they can't totally use their skill set. Or you, you have the other way where he's very, very quick. He's very able to like make the cuts and he's able to make people miss. But when it gets to the open field, either he and this is where you have to look, you have, you have to use some of the left brain, you have to use some of the data that you have to all right, can he not open up or do, is he not seeing it? Is he not seeing the open field and he just is better in tight spaces and he likes a tight space? And that's where you can find with some of the data. All right, he is fast. He is able to open up. Now let's go to create a little bit longer field, a little bit shorter. So when he does make somebody miss, his only option is to not make somebody miss and stay in another tight space, but to open it back up. And something else that you'll see a ton is athletes that are really good on one-on-one they struggle in a 2v2 situation when there's Mm -hmm. more things happening around them. And now they have to make the right decision. All right, they beat one defender, their other defenders there and the other offensive guys there. Can they just go and score or do they have to use their teammate? And that's something that you see, like you just organically watch where are they struggling? What angles aren't they hitting? What aren't they processing correctly? And maybe you're completely wrong. There's, There's been times where it's like, all right, I think this guy is struggling in 1v1 situation. So I'm going to pull him out of this 2v2 put them in the one V one situation, just one-on-one we're going to both sprint at a cone and we got, maybe it's a triple gate. So you got a gate to your left, a gate to your right, a gate 45 degrees. All right. That guy's winning every single time in the one V one situation. So it's not that. So then you got to go back to the two V two game and watch it again. What, what is the struggle piece? Maybe it, okay. It is velocity. Like that's what he's struggling. And then we got to go back to some of the basic, we're going to run some flying tens with you like that. That's where you're struggling and then bring it back to the game. And, that's kind of how we work on creating scores in the football world and piecing that together. It's never pretty. It's never perfect, but nothing that we do is. And I think we need to admit that as well. It's like we're piecing this together. We're trying to build the best athlete, but this drill isn't the answer that that person's drill isn't the answer, but my drill also isn't the answer. We're just trying to piece and expose and give you pieces for you to be able to use next time you're trying to score. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I, it makes me think about too, just how valuable it is for, for people like me, who I didn't have a football background, but even just in coaching youth sports, it's just what a basic and easy way to get started with manipulating the space or manipulating one-on-ones and 2v2s. And as I've listened to people like you and Michael Zwiefel and James Smith and others talk about these different constraints, it it doesn't hit home, I think, as much. If you just live in the weight room and it's weights and plyos and things, which is awesome, but until you actually get on the field that's just it's just like a a verbiage you know you're not really experiencing it and so as you're talking about this just having gone through just a season of even coaching youth soccer I'm like yeah I get that more and even in the way I um I of course do games in the gym with athletes who are there to train just generally but it will definitely make those games better as well just understanding that so um, I think that's really cool well, and that's one of the most frustrating pieces is like I mean you go on Twitter and you go on Instagram and it's like we're talking about sets and reps and we're talking about this exercise selection and we're talking about even like maybe it is ISOs Like we're talking about these things and like, it doesn't matter if you're not looking at it on the field, you know, and that, that, that's a big piece that we're missing. It's like, we, we look at all the sexy lifts and we look at all this and how can we get their one rep max up? How can we get their bar speed up? How can we do this stuff? Are we watching them on the field? Because when you watch them on the field and even better if you can put yourself on the field in some way. Like I talk all the time about slow pitch softball and it's like <laughs> I'm lifting the most that I'm doing, I'm doing, but it's not working at the plate. There's so much psychology that going on. Like, are we piecing these things together? Are we, or are we just sitting in the weight room with a bunch of other weight room people having conversations about how important the weight room is? Yes. It's a piece of the puzzle, but you got to go look on the field and listen, look, listen, and just watch. Like that's another, like if aliens were to watch a football game, They'd be like, all right, this is what matters. They're, they're, they're perceiving, they're moving, they're sprinting, and they're doing that. But we've been indoctrinated into this strength and conditioning sector, and we've spent millions of dollars on our weight room. And we sit in rooms, people telling us that we're right, we're right. This squat matters, front squat over back squat, single leg over double leg. You know, like we talk about all these things. But then we get on the field and it really doesn't like you, you need to have a base level of leveling up. You need to have a base level organism and we need to work on that. But how are you expanding that? How are you bridging that gap on the field? And the people that say that that's what practice will take care of that practice will take care of that. It's like, have you watched a practice? Cause it won't like, unless you 
unless you are able to go into a football practice and change the complete culture of football, the hundred year culture of football, which ideally we want to do in the long term, but unless you're going to do that, practice is not going to take care of it. They're, they're running over bags. They're they're dropping. They're taking a forty. I talked with Will, Will Rattel about this. They're they're dropping forty five degrees to five yards specifically, holding that spot, chopping their feet, and they're going forward. You know, like that is not perceiving and reacting to anything. And the best athletes just get out of it. Like they, they just survive those drills and then they're able to perceive and react and drop in their background. But we can do a, a, such a better job of immersing them in these engaging opportunities to perceive and react to the environment around them. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. The, um, the ability to watch practice. And I mean, it is, it is interesting though, right? Like the gen, like James Smith general dynamics of, uh, I guess I can't even remember the exact name of the book, but just like the global dynamics of, of sport. And at the end of the day, um, I mean, if the sport coach could do it all, they, you know, they could do it all. Like, it's just, there's just, there is a lot of information out there with the different realms and things like that. And I understand how everything works together, but at the end of the day, like you should be able to speak a common language. Uh, each member of the team should be able to understand what, um, like what, what might be missing in this part of practice? Like you said, just running over bags or, or things like that. I uh, would you also, would you say, um, just from like a general, um, so general scores mentality, maybe anything else you want to add with that? Like that's not football specific or just athletes in general, trying to get them in, um, to, to just help them achieve that a little bit more readily. Yeah. And that, that's, I think it goes back a little bit to the confidence piece and something that I want probably take it a little bit differently, like play like conjugate style your games, like expose them to as many different games as possible. Find out where they suck, find out what they're really good at, and then ebb and flow between what they suck at and what they're good at and play with that confidence level. That's something that's really cool. You have an athlete that's an amazing racket sport athlete. Maybe they played tennis as a kid and they're amazing. Like we play this, um, like we play hand tennis and they're, they're, they're amazing at this weird game that we made up, but it's, it's basically like a tennis type game, a little bit different rules long rallies they're amazing at that so maybe they're having a rough day or maybe they're just confidence level is low you see it coming in it's like all right we're going to play that hand tennis game today or maybe it's the other way maybe they're super high they, they, and you can tell they're little, uh, maybe bordering on the arrogance level um and maybe it's just an athlete that is arrogant expose them to something that they suck at we, we had an athlete a soccer athlete that was amazing like he's just a beautiful athlete like a deer of an athlete does everything that you want he wins pretty much in everything and it's like, all right, you need, you need to humble that kid in a sense of we're going to play Frisbee and it's going to be something you suck at. How do you handle that? All right. Usually you don't handle it very well if it's your first time losing, but I would much rather you lose in this setting. And then we talk about it and we talk about how you, your anger just built up because you weren't good at the game and you, you freaked out in the middle of the game or you're yelling at your teammates. It's like, all right, now expand that to your sport. Like what's going to happen when you struggle in your sport? It's going to be the same exact thing. So that's where it's, I love the conjugate style of games of we're going to expose them to as me- one. It's fun. Like they, they don't really know what's happening when they come. So it's like the, co- the athletes talk about like the excitement piece. Like, Ooh, what are we playing today? What are we trying out today Two, you get a bunch of movement variability, which is great. Like we always talk about that, like expose them to a ton of different things and the younger, the better that you can expose them to that. But mentality wise, how can you give them something they're really good at and something like we play, we work with a lot of fast pitch uh, softball players. You, you get them, they're in a slump of adding something, doing something like that. And you play a game that they're really good at and you get that confidence higher. And now they're able to expand that to their practice, their game, that type of thing. Or the other aspect of working with, all right, dealing with failure, exposing them to failure for the first time in a controlled setting that a game. That, and the other part, Joel, is getting them to understand these games do not matter. Like that is something that like, you get a bunch of highly competitive athletes in there and they'll like start screaming at each other and yelling Mm -hmm. at each other. And in one part, you love that. You love that competitive nature. You love that fire. You love that energy. But in the second part, it's like, all right, what is, what's that emotional instability coming from? Where's that coming from? Where's that drive coming from? Why do you feel like you need the win? Why do you feel like you need the approval from the coach? And I think one of the coolest parts is exposing them to games that do not like this hand tennis game. Nobody's ever going to look at your hand tennis highlights. Nobody gives a shit. Like it's a random game that we play getting them to understand that. Like, it's all right to lose. I would rather you, you, you try for something cool and you're, you're, you're bringing up your teammates and you're doing that type of stuff in this setting. And it's the one time they can play and compete 
I wouldn't even say compete, but play without, um, without a negative consequence coming with it, you know, like, so I think there's so many pieces psychologically to that, that we need to look at and talk about and just think about. And I, that, that, that's why I love your podcast, Joel, because it's like your experience, you're, you're experiencing with the fringes. Like you bring a lot of fringe guys on and you're experiencing with the fringes. And what that does is allow the field to think about something else, to think about fringe pieces. And the cool part about fringes is that most of the time they're wrong. Like most of the, that's the reason they're a fringe piece. It's the reason they're not mainstream. If it was completely right, it would probably be adopted by everybody. But the fringe allows you to think about things differently, to, to kind of approach it in a different way and just like, oh, okay, we could think about it this way. We could approach it this way. And when you start experimenting with things that way, you really have a growth in your program, a growth with your athletes, the growth as a coach that I don't think is, is approached in our field. Because right now it's all mainstream. Like it, when you're brought up, it's CSCI. Like it's, it's the mainstream stuff that we know is right. And in quotations, we know it's right. Like that's the other thing with this field. Like we don't know things are right. If we knew things were right, every one of us would be able to create a world champion. We can't do that. Like we cannot, we cannot guarantee a world champion. We cannot even... When you're working with Olympians, you can't guarantee he's going to win gold. So we don't have the answers and we just have to admit we don't have the answers. So we allow ourselves to experiment and get closer to the answers rather than sitting in our tight polos in our weight room, in our million dollar weight room saying, this is it. This three by five is the answer. We have it. We have it figured out. And it's like, no, you don't. There's so many fringe pieces that we can experiment with, but our egos usually don't let us. Yeah, I. it's interesting. Um Paul Cater, back when he was on the show, had said that that the gym is a place where you can fail, like you can be created. I think um, it was probably Michael Zwiefel or someone, someone in that. Uh, maybe Tyler, you're, I don't remember exactly, um, but like the gym, also you can have courage to be more creative. Like it's this place where we can get away from the pressure of winning for just a little bit. Although, like you said, people still get really into winning like and that's actually one skill that i think i've improved on is being able to play any game and be okay like in just a gym context it because i used to take losing really hard um back up not i mean insanely hard but i was always really disappointed in basketball especially or or track if i didn't do well and it was almost i felt like it was a skill to just be able to play any game and lose and be okay with it <laughs> it's and i think i cultivated that throughout my 20s and um, just yeah, thinking about what other coaches have said that one of the things that makes the gym a special place is the fact that it's not your sport. And although, I mean, it, it can also be something that you can use like with the perception reaction and set up things that are specific, but at the same time, it can be something that isn't that you can use to learn. And that doesn't have the immediate pressures that you've been facing your whole life from your parents and your coaches and your club coaches and all this, you know, you can just train and be a human for once. <laughs> And um, I really think that makes it a special place. Yeah. And, it, and I think, it, I mean, at the end of the day, it just boils down to creating emotional awareness because again, you don't want to eliminate the competitive nature of anybody. Uh, we talked to, we talked, we had a whole, I had a whole 10 minute rant about creating winners. Like we don't want to create, eliminate that part and give everybody a trophy. Like that's not what it is being aware of that. It's being aware of the confidence aspect. Okay. I feel confident. I feel good here. Okay. I feel bad here. I feel that, but I'm not going to react to that, you know, like creating that awareness and having them ebb and flow between those two mm -hmm. and talking to them about that. Like, oh, you're feeling bad right now. Oh, I can tell you don't feel this, you know, ebbing and flowing between those two aspects and in the middle ground and just being aware of it, not trying to eliminate it, not really trying to super control like uh, the stoic, like we're never going to react to anything, which I don't think is stoic in the, I think it's a, a bastardization of the stoic mindset but we're not reacting to anything we're emotionless like we're all emotional human beings but having the exposure and somebody there to talk to you about that stuff like this is what you're feeling here why like what where is that coming from what's that going to lead to this is what you're feeling you're feeling confident all right what's the benefits to that what's the negatives to that and trying to lay it out in a way where they can process it and start to understand their own bodies and their own minds rather than amping up the winners and telling the losers they suck yeah the winning is certainly still you know evolution human evolution being the best you can be and and winning and scoring is certainly you know an important part of it but it's all how do you, i mean i think for me personally i can say this is i mean i tried as hard as anybody like to win and 
I, but it was my insecurities that actually kept me from, because you can try too hard. You can take swings and momentum too hard. You can take things personally that you can see momentum shifts in your physiology happening. <laughs> and it's like when you can learn to transcend that a little bit, which I think is an important part of the game too, then you can, yeah, you can take that next step forward. So yeah, I would agree with you. I mean, ultimately we want to be the best we can be, but you being able to take a step back and look at things in context and use things as teaching moments, I think is really valuable. And I think that insecurity part is super important too, because I mean, same Joel, like I was, I was a very similar athlete. It's like, I created this persona of being the dude, being the alpha. And when you do that, all it is, is the insecurity of you don't want to fail. So then you never expose yourself to fail failure because you don't want to lose that persona. You don't want to lose being the alpha. You don't want to lose being the dude. You're the tough guy on the football team. Like you, you, you're the winner. And when you do that, you create that insecurity. You never expose yourself to failure. Like when you never expose yourself to failure, you're never going to grow. And you're just going to sit at that same base level. And when you look at what could happen in a four year or five year athletic career in college, like the amount of growth that an athlete can have in five years, exposing themselves to failure because they're able, like they're able to accept that is incredible. I've seen athletes completely change everything about their body and everything about who they are as an athlete and what they are on the field completely in four years. And like, that is so long, but when you're in the moment and you're constantly rewarded for it by a coach of being the tough guy, being the alpha, and then not you having that insecurity yourself and not wanting to expose the failure, you slow down that progress tremendously. You are the same athlete you are year two that you are year three, that you are year four, because you never want to fail. But like, you got it. You got to have coaches. You got to have leaders in your life that are all right with letting you fail and telling you, you put yourself out there. You, you tried that role. You tried that move and that led to failure. That's all right. Like that's going to lead to something that you, you, you learn something and creating failure is, I mean, it is the typical growth mindset of failure is not losing. Like losing in that moment is not losing in life. It's adding a piece like, okay, Either I can't use that move in that moment, or I'm not good enough at that move, or it just didn't make sense. I need to do this. But as long as you're able to approach it that way, rather than avoid it and just do what you're good at, which I'm, as common sense as that is, there's so many athletes that just do what they're good at for four years. And they're the same athlete. Whereas you could have that insane amount of growth if you're able to expose yourself to failures and eliminate that insecurity. I like the polarities. I like... um I've been really on polarities in more just physical and, and mechanical stressors recently in the sense of like, all right, here a polarity is doing some short sprints and then go do a 200 meter squatty run or something, you know, or, or go run, like I've talked about with um, Rob Assis, like go run the 110 hurdles and then do a long jump, like something that's a long energy system and a short and, or using long extreme ISO holds or, or whatever, or like a long, long skips or tempo sprints to recover a short a short burst, things like that in the polarities. But also I hadn't thought about it in the polarity of, all right, do something you're good at. Now do something you're bad at. Now do so, you know, like that's awesome. I, I just, because if we're approaching the mental side too, and I see a lot of young kids, athletes coming up who like, they have to win. Like they can't, they don't want to do things they're bad at. And I've saw that in the college sector for matured athletes who didn't want to do things they were bad at. And it's like, no, if you can expose that early and start to, I mean, look at, um, I mean, I think the ultimate example or a great example would be, well, look at Michael Jordan. He went and did a sport, baseball, that he was in the grand scheme of things relative to other players pretty bad at. <laughs> but look at how much he worked, like just how hard he worked to uh, evolve and improve himself in doing something that was not, you know, a 6'6 dude basketball player to go play baseball. Like, very, very different and just how admirable to go do something that he was so bad at in, in one of the greatest athletes of our time. Yeah, and I think that's a, that's the good point. Like he's one of the greatest of all times and he, he's exposing yourself to it. Like as a 18 year old kid, I think you're all right exposing yourself to failure when, and again, I think part of it's putting everything in perspective. It's like you are a sliver in time and the sliver of a moment, like mm -hmm. in the grand scheme of things that failure and you need to be able to put yourself in this mindset. At least it helped me a ton is that failure. Nobody's ever going to notice, you know, mm -hmm. like then that is, you feel like you're the center of the universe. You feel like everybody's watching and everybody's judging. And even if they are like, it's a sliver of a moment and a sliver of time. Fail, get over it, be all right with it, take it for what it is and go. 
And like you said, Michael Jordan, the greatest athlete with everybody watching him, did it. Yeah, with everybody so as, watching. Yeah, it's not like it's just in the gym. Yes. Like everyone's watching you do a sport that you are not relative to others that good at. At least not yet. Uh, and do we do we hate on him for that? Does anybody say Michael Jordan sucks at basketball? Michael Jordan sucks. You know, like nobody says that because he went to go play baseball and wasn't. You know, like yeah. nobody says that. They, they, he's still the greatest of all time. Yeah, like it, 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 the eighteen year old failing at the gym at the YMCA. You know, like you just got to be able to be all right with that. And I love I love that example. Yeah, and, and I'm watching the last dance, which actually I, I rarely watch TV, but I love like just getting like sports sports documentaries are like some of my favorite things. Um, like the last dance, and then there was like the Malice in the Palace special that was really interesting. Um, but I, uh, yeah, it was it was just so cool to, because right at the end of that baseball run of his, like he had improved a lot, like he was evolving, he was leveling up, and I don't know if that that wasn't as much the story i heard when he went to play baseball it's more like when's he going to get back into basketball or whatever but it's like the dude was leveling up in baseball i mean that mentality was coming out it was just so cool and i um i just think that um it's just to uh here's what here's what my thought was it took me a second to grab it but so often in the weight room in the gym in physical training we want to find, and I, I don't think there's necessarily anything. This is just one way you can do it is have athletes fail because to like, for whatever mental reason, again, I'm not saying like the grind, like, like not, not for the sake of even conditioning, but more like just that fail. So you can do what it takes to pass. If that makes sense. I, I'm not, I'm not a you know beat people up with conditioning type person at all, but I do think there's some value in finding something an athlete can't do to see their strategy to how do you do it. And I think that probably a better tool so often is using like a sport or a skill you're bad at. You can use that too. You don't just, have, if you're a, a strength coach, you don't just have to say, all right, I'm going to put you on this test and oh, you failed it. You know, like <laughs> you, I mean, I do think like, yeah, long ISO holds and things like that. Great place to level up. But I think that how much more in line with sport to find something and more context, uh, more contextual to sport in many ways to find a sport you're bad at, you know, a skill with the ball you're bad at and have to, and you lost <laughs> and have, you have to deal with that, you know? So I think there's many tools that you can utilize. Yeah. And if you want to expand it even a step farther outside of sports, it's like one of the things I love doing is like not uh, failing. I don't know if failing is the right word, but like, failing in the fashion sense showing up wearing like goofball stuff showing up being yourself showing up mm -hmm. like putting yourself out there like i wear goofy shorts i wear mismatching socks i wear like the funny shirts you know like not showing up like a fucking oh, sorry i shouldn't swear but uh, showing <laughs> up like a in my polo like uh, in the sense of and it, as you you have the professional sense i understand that but to me what's more important is showing the athlete who you truly are, being your true self, putting that out there. So then they can be like, oh, like the leader, the guy we're looking to, the guy we're paying to come make us better is doing that. I can probably do that. I can probably be myself. I probably don't have to do this because somebody else, like nobody's judging you here, you know, like in a non, again, I don't want to get into the participation. It's not in that sense, but like, Nobody is sitting there being like, why are you wearing that? Why are you doing that? Why are you saying that? It's, this is my thought. This is what I want to wear. This is what I want to do. I'm going to wear mismatching socks. I'm going to do the yin and yang socks, the black and white. I'm going to talk to you about this stuff and why we're doing it and just being yourself and how powerful that is just as an like instant opening up factor of the athlete of you get them to start like first day, they always show up in there. Either if they're from a high school or college, they'll show up in their high school black shirt with their logo on it and the black pants, the logo on it. And they'll show up in that. And it by usually week two, they're showing up with one of their funny shirts that they have and goofball shorts. And they're usually wearing goofy socks, you know, like they're doing all these things. And once you get them to be comfortable in that sense and comfortable in their own world like that, then you can draw into the athletics and do the game based stuff. And then you can draw into the sport itself. But Again, you can take it even another level farther and just work on the human aspect of being all right with failing in that sense, being all right with being the bunt of a joke, you know, being all right with not having to be the the perfect person, like showing them people are not perfect, which I think is misunderstood. Like when you have a leader in your life, and I, I've had this for a lot, like I look up to somebody, I'm like, that person is perfect, that this is who I want to be. And it creates this like 
fake understanding of what people are. It's like, we're all flawed. We're all messed up. We all have our own things. And most people try to hide that. It's you put that out there and have people understand that then you can have conversations. You can have growth and you can kind of go from there rather than that person has the answers. I, I, I did it with Joe DeFranco. Like that person has the answers. And yet you listen to Joe DeFranco and how much he evolves and changes. And he's like, I don't basically he's saying I don't have the answers, but yet you still have people that say Joe DeFranco has the answers. And so they only listen to what he has. Same thing with Mike Boyle. I, like same, like the Mike Boyle has the answers. All right. What does Mike, what is Mike Boyle known for doing? Like he's known for changing the field, changing from the bilateral squat to a unilateral squat implementing the sprints making the tony holler thing popular like he is known for evolving yet people don't see that people see mike boyle system you know and then they start to swear by that and you create the same problems the same problems that are there and nobody's evolving after that and that's where it's like what made these people successful is evolving and being all right with being themselves being all right with being on the fringe and exploring and what what did they change what field did they change they changed the field of before them it was the structured somebody else has the answers and they came in and they, they were the rebels and they broke the rebel, like they rebelled, they changed the field. And now we're almost back to the cycle of now you got DeFranco who is an original rebel and you had Boyle who is an original rebel. And now they're like the cemented figures and people are bowing down to them. And it's like, all right, every, like everybody needs to be the rebel. Everybody needs to explore these fringes and change and not the rebel to rebel, but just to approach it in the sense of nobody has the answers. Yeah, I, I really like the idea of, um, like you you went back to the beginning. You said something about like coaches. It's almost like coaches want to show like we have the drills. Like I got the drills. I got you know I'm dressed up like like the first coach you said walked in. He had like the national you know whatever shirt on, indicating he was a great coach or great player someday, and had all these drills. And the players just didn't eventually kind of petered out. But it's like the the ability to show like your humanity, like, and not just put yourself up on in this position, like, Oh, I'm this amazing, you know, coach and everything I say is right. You know, like you have to, you have to get past that. I love the idea of, yeah. The, like, even like I've seen athletes who have like kind of a dress up day or something like that every now and then. And, and I've even found in youth coaching, like when I, um, when you kind of take the wall away, um, in the sense of like, well, I'm going to play a game with the players. It's like kick the coach or the coaches try to keep the ball <laughs> away from the five-year-olds. Like they, they go nuts. Like they love that stuff. When you take that wall, you know, again, I think it's important to have that coach athlete distinction, but sometimes when that wall, you know, can come down a little bit, like you said that you're wearing some goofy clothes or there's something where the athletes, oh yeah, you're human. We're, we're both human too. Like, I get it. We're not, you know, we're not perfect. You don't have it all figured out. I, I, I think there's a lot of value in that. I'm glad you brought that point up. Yeah. And listening. And that's like the number one thing, the podcast, the number one changing point in my life is having people like coach Boyle on the podcast, having these great, amazing coaches on the podcast and they say it, you know, like they say these things or you can tell and you can watch and like their brain, like you can tell these things. So like the greatest in the world do it, the greatest in the world think it, but we, 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 we don't fully understand that. And I, I just think if the more you, the more you really look for it, the more you really start to understand that we're all humans and we all don't have the answers. And like reading like meditations by Marcus Aurelius, like you listen to him talk about like the great, like he talks about how Aristotle and Plato, like he sees like, and they're, they're all gone. They're all forgotten. They're all like remembered by a few lines and a few books. Mm -hmm. It's like, all right, those were the greatest thinkers of all time. Mm -hmm. And they're remembered by a few lines and a few books, you know, like that strength coach that has been around five years probably it should not have a statue made of him you know <laughs> in, that, in that sense you know like we gotta we gotta be able to expand it back to history and expand it to the greatest in the world have these thoughts and are thinking that way yet in our field in our weight room in our meetings it's like th this guy's put on a pedestal and we we shouldn't we should steal from everybody we should understand the great things coach Boyle has the great things coach DeFranco has great things you have the great things I have and we should steal from all of it and grab it all, but we should think about it. We should really think about it. And does that make sense? I, like there's some, I'm sure there's things out there that I'm an idiot for saying, and I'll look back in five years. and like, that was stupid for thinking that way. And I want somebody right now to listen to me and be like, he's an idiot now. Like he's, he, I'm, I'm not putting that together now, but you, you just can't put coaches on a pedestal or anybody on a pedestal and then try to think about it in your own way. Like we, we got to all be able to think individually. Yeah, I love it. Last, um, last quick question is I know a lot of what you talk about is probably more, a little more chaotic. It's a little more, 
uh, things that are probably a little more of the right-brained or yin nature, things that are a little more um, not as easy to define, if that makes sense. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question that ha- that deals with the the line between order and chaos. And it's funny because as we talk about so many topics on this show, there's a lot of fine lines, <laughs> you know, like winning and taking winning too seriously, and then you know, you know, you know what I'm saying, like, and but. Maybe just in the context of you going in and writing a training session, thinking about that session, what will this session deliver? What, how does that shake out? Just because I think it, yeah, it could be easy just to be like, oh, it's just a bunch of, this is just really an organized game. Just roll a ball out there and it's just, you know, free for all and everyone, you know, like, and in some senses, maybe it is, but (laughs) what, uh, what would a training session look like? You're like coming in, laying it out, thinking about different things. What does that look like, Austin? Yeah. So like traditionally, like you, you think about what a training session looks like and you're, you're going to talk about like you, you see everybody set up the programs like, all right, this is your horizontal push. This is your vertical pull. This is your unilateral squat. And while that is great, like the physical part of it is great. You want to be able to hit all these parts and like you don't want to be able to miss systems are great. Yes, that's that's perfect. But like to me, it, it, there, there, there's so much it's so much deeper, like you can go into the psychological world. So it's like, all right. When we get them in, we, we understand that flow state is huge for skill retention. We understand that joy and um, looking forward to train, looking forward to anything, but looking forward to training, looking forward to learning a skill is really, really important for skill retention. Uh, and if you want to look at the weight room numbers, like having freedom to pick what you want to do, having freedom and not feeling like you're trapped, you have to do something helps a ton with soreness levels, like all these physical benefits come back to the psychological world. So you come in and we know flow state's important. So let's program something that's going to get them in the flow state in some regard, uh, an enjoyment base, something that makes them smile, something that makes them laugh. So that's the first part that I have to my thing. All right, flow state. How can we get them in that flow state? How can we get them to laugh? How can we get them to smile? Then we got them happy. We got them in this flow state. We got them enjoying. How can we funnel that energy that we just created in the sense, in quotations, created that flow state, you created that energy, got a bunch of smiling, happy athletes. What do you do with that energy? So then we talk about the funnel process. So now we funnel it into something that we want to work on that day. Maybe it's something skill retention. Maybe maybe we want to learn a skill with an athlete. Maybe we want to master a certain route. Uh, So that's where we would funnel into that. Maybe it's output based. Maybe we want to run our flying tens right after that. So We'll funnel it into an output-based thing that we want to work on that day. We'll run flying tens. We'll do our squats. We'll do our jumps, whatever it is. But we created this energy. Now we're going to use this energy. But that's all kind of external. It's very social. After that happens, that energy is really, really high. How can you bring them back in? How can you draw them internally to an internal focus? And that's where we really like to use our ISOs and like our 100 to 1,000 rep schemes. You draw them back into themselves, Mm. all right? ton of energy, ton of social aspects going on. Thing is high. Maybe this is perfect when the game is going great. Now, how can we ebb and flow back into, all right, now I got to hold this position for five minutes. Now it's just me, myself, and I doing this drop catch 1,000 reps from my shoulders. All right, that's a totally different mindset. How can you program in a sense of getting them the ebb and flow between that super high mindset and that super low mindset? And now you have them in that low mindset. You have them internally focused. You have them in that ISO, that long rep. Can you bring them back out of that? How quickly does that athlete adapt when, all right, they just got done with that ISO. Maybe they're exhausted mentally and physically. Can you bring them back up? So now we'll bring them back up to doing something they enjoy. Maybe it's like an arm session. You know, they'll they'll, they'll rip some arms or just something a little bit more enjoyable, a little bit more high energy. You'll have the social aspect in there. Maybe we'll do some, uh, we really like implementing their like partner pushed, like a quasi, like a, a hip raise. We'll do a quasi hip raise with partner resisted. So In that regard, you just went from an internal ISO focus to now somebody's touching you. You got to communicate with them more or less. But now you got that community aspect. You got the energy a little bit higher. You got to go external focus and then draw them back in again. And you finish the session internally. You finish with a stillness practice. You finish with meditation. You finish with maybe more ISOs or 100 to 1,000 rep schemes. And you program in that ebbing and flowing way. And then you pick up on things. All right, that athlete is really good, good at going from the super high setting to the super low setting, but they are horrible at getting themselves back out of that super low setting. Can we talk about that? Can we talk about what they're struggling with? Can we talk about why that is? Maybe it's just exposure. Maybe they're not used to going super low and then coming back up. But in a game, you have to do that. In life, you have to do that. Or it's the other way. Maybe they, they, they're they super good at the going from the, the high to low or the, the low to high. And you, you just want to watch these things and talk about them 
and expose them to that ebbing and flowing mindset. Because again, on the field, there's 100 reps, 150 reps in a game, you know, so they're going to ebb and flow. They're going to win. When, especially a lot of the baseball players, you, you look at it, it's like the best in the world are going to win 30% of the time, <laughs> you know, like mm-hmm. they, they really got to be able to ebb and flow between being on a hot streak, being a low streak, striking out, hitting the ball, you know, so how can we use our training session to get them mentally to a point of exposing them to that ebbing and flowing of high, low, high, low, low, high, low, high. And then talking to them about that, seeing where their struggles are at and then exposing them to where their struggles are more. Like if I have an athlete that is really bad at coming back internal focus, and that's actually probably more common than getting back up. Like lots of athletes can get really excited. Not very many athletes are very good at going internal um, in those ISOs that they want to move. They want to twitch in the stillness practice. They, they just, they, 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 they aren't very good or comfortable with being by themselves quiet not moving mastering something so then just expose them to that a ton until they do master it and have conversations about that and then bring them back to the ebbing and flowing piece i love that just yeah back to the the polarity a little bit like just to to the different states of mind and if the same if the, if the training session is based on the same grind the whole time you know like the same or drill like mentality how can you there's less information that you can get but i also think there's less uh, like like you said, like going from kind of more of a, a game like scenario into outputs, I think that's just a tremendous warm up. It's amazing. You're going to run faster, or jump higher, and then finishing with more of that that it's you and yourself and the mental. I, there's so many things you can draw that I really um, I really enjoy your how you describe that. I've I've definitely done similar things, but I haven't. Um, I don't think I pay attention to it quite the same way that you or in what you're looking for. And so the way you describe it will really help me. Uh, in my own ebb and flow with that situation but i i just i love that stuff it's just so many opportunities um i know i've i've also done it where and I, with tommy john like uh just where the thousand reps is almost the first thing <laughs> that's an interesting um way to spin it too although i'll be a little bit more difficult for athletes to get excited about but it's it's that's powerful as well so i really like how you have that that ebb and flow and the way that you're looking at that yeah, the, the thousand. And that's something I think I actually need to do a better job of myself. Uh, I think it was Grant Fowler mentioned, like, you don't always want to get them into a flow state. And I think that's something where I get addicted to, like, bring high energy just because they're coming in. And usually it is because they're already at a low, low state, like they're coming from class or doing it. But something that I want to continue to progress is bringing them again, bring them into that low state. Like you said, like starting off with a thousand reps, starting off with the spinal flow, starting off with something that is boring and then seeing if they can come come back mm-hmm. up get 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 high after that that's something that i think i need to as a coach continue to progress as well is like working on that aspect from that low to high instantly rather than mid-workout where they've already experienced that high they've already been able to get into a high mindset yeah that's that's a cool thought like athletes who do who can succeed going you know the thousand rep into the outputs or into the main versus those you know and i know jeremiah flood has talked in you know about if athletes are really worn out he'll use games if they're feeling pretty good you use isos it'd be interesting to get tommy's opinion too on on that you know coming in with that kind of stuff i'm sure we could talk about it forever but it's it really has my mind um kind of ticking and thinking and i'll be um i'm sure i'll be experimenting with different combinations of that and i'll report back to you what i what i find out it's really interesting yeah same i'm, I'm gonna be working with that stuff for sure all right cool well, Austin, man, it was awesome having you on. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, your thoughts. It's really cool seeing what you're up to. And I'll have to come train with you someday, man. I'm excited. We're not we're not too terribly far away. So maybe one of these days I can make it up there and we'll have to shoot, do a little video shoot on uh, our training session. I was going to say with the move, we're pretty close to each other. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. We just got a new gym. We got like 70 yards of turf now. So we have, we have plenty of room for rolly rolls and activities. Oh, I love it. I love it. Sounds good, man. Well, hey, thanks again, Austin. I appreciate it. Coach, thanks for having me on. Thanks for tuning in for another show. I appreciate you being here with us. And this has been certainly a fun journey as we've gone along these 280 episodes. If you enjoy what we're doing, you can leave us a rating or a view on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, whatever you're listening to. We would really appreciate you leaving that rating and helping spread the message of this podcast to others who might be interested in it. We'll see you guys next week with another great show. Have a good one.